All right, so the first camera we got up is the Pentax 67. This is the later version of the Pentax 6x7. Uh, really popular portrait camera uh, made throughout the 60s and 70s. The later model that they produced in the 90s was the Pentax 672. So this is the right in the middle of those two, the Pentax 6x7 and 672. Comes with a mirror lockup function so you don't uh, have to deal with too much vibration from the mirror slapping up when you take a picture. I've never really used that function too much, but I have a 45mm uh, f4 lens, nice sharp wide angle lens. The 35mm equivalent of it is I believe around 18 to 20 millimeters. So really good for portraits, architecture, uh, landscapes. Uh, it might be a little wide uh, for portraits, but that's okay. Um, I have a 3D printed grip on here that came from Poland. That really helps out with the ergonomics of the camera, considering its size and weight. And then I have a standard prism viewfinder on here. And that by itself probably weighs around four pounds. And you, know, you take that off, you can use it as a waist level viewfinder, which is uh, really popular for some people to do. It shoots 120 and 220 film. And on a roll of 120 film, you get 10 exposures. And on a roll of 220, you get 20 exposures. And to switch between films, the pressure plate in the back here, you just push that down and slide it over. And that's how to change that. And you also have to twist a small knob right in here so the film uh, advance function knows what kind of roll you're shooting. It's got a couple sync ports up here for flash. Yeah, these cameras are really sought after. Uh, they've come back in popularity a lot recently. They've been presented as a more affordable alternative to uh, Hasselblad medium format cameras, which can range anywhere from like $800 just for the body, and that's not including a lens, viewfinder, or film bag. And so these have definitely gone up in price recently. Very durable. Pop the lens off here. That inside, right inside there is the mirror. So you can see just by the size of that thing, that mirror lockup function definitely did come in handy for a lot of people. It's never a feature I've used too, too much though. But yeah, this has definitely been one of my favorites to use lately. Uh, next one up is a crowd favorite. I've had this thing for 12 years now. It's just a Polaroid 1600. You know, just drop down right there, load in a pack of film, close it up. Good to go. Now, this is probably a, as basic as a plastic fantastic camera can get. It's got a flash, which you can't turn on or off. It just fires automatically. It does have a red eye reduction and a self timer, but uh, no tripod socket. Yeah, I've put, I don't even know how many packs of film through this bad boy. You know, yeah, 12 years later, it still works perfectly. Next up is the Fujifilm Neo Classic, the uh, Instax Mini 90. I've had a lot of fun with these cameras recently. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the size of the picture, but um, the lens is on them, really sharp, a lot of good controls on the back, you know, manual, turn the flash on and off, red eye reduction, you can turn on macro mode, decent charge time on the battery isn't too long, battery lasts for, I think, 10 packs of film, and it's kind of nice to see that uh, instant film has come back into style, especially with, you know, Fujifilm, who is notoriously cold towards the analog photography section of their business. And next up is my Leica R4. This was given to me by my grandmother. I have two lenses. This is the 50mm f2, and uh, Leica is really known for their rangefinders and M-series of cameras. A Leica SLR isn't something you're going to see very often, but with analog photography coming back, you know, into the spotlight, they're a little more prevalent. Leica lenses can't be beat, sharp as a tack, really durable, all made from brass. This one's nice. It has a built-in lens hood that just pops in and out. It's got a couple different metering modes. It's got an auto mode, program, manual, really good built-in light meter. And above all, I'm glad that function works on this camera. Don't have to tote around a, an external light meter or use your phone. But uh, yeah, this has been a workhorse camera of mine for several years now. When I got serious about photography, this was my go-to camera for many years and still is. The other lens I have for it is a 70 to 210 millimeter f4. That's commonly referred to as a beer can lens because it looks like a can of beer. That's a pretty sharp lens, but you know, obviously, this was before the advent of image stabilization. So 
I tend not to use the telephoto lens for this thing too, too often. Pretty much everything you could ask for in a uh, SLR package. Going back to Polaroids, uh, this one I had a lot of fun with uh, when I got it. It's a Polaroid LAN camera, a 340 model. So you just pop down the front here, flip up the viewfinder, push that up and extend it. Uh, this is cool, it's a uh, rangefinder uh, Polaroid. And it's got two separate viewfinders here, one for focusing and one for composing your shot. Um, honestly, I'd like to see these come back into the market, uh, the film for these, just because the film in general, you know, the lenses are really sharp, the color of the film is really good. Uh, it does take a little bit of getting used to, a little bit of a learning curve. Overall, it, uh, it's been a good experience shooting with that. The batteries for it are a little hard to find, but uh, once you actually, you know, get a hold of the battery, and, you, know, you know, where to get them, it's not too much of a problem. The hardest part though was finding one of these in working condition. A lot of times what you'll see is in the battery compartment in the back here is a lot of corrosion, you know, frayed wires, and you don't need a battery to shoot this thing, but it does help a lot for the in-camera light meter. And so that's the light meter right there. Then to pop the shutter, you just pull that down and the shutter button right there. So these things were really popular back in the day. So next up, I uh, got a Keystone Model A7, and this is pretty cool. Uh, it's a 16 millimeter video uh, motion picture camera from the late 1950s, I believe. Uh, it's a spring-driven motor, so you just wind it up on the side here. And then it has a small viewfinder right here, and I'm not 100% sure what the focal length of the lens is. I do know, though, it is f2.5 to f16, and so yeah, it'll be a lot of fun to get into uh, motion picture film in the future here. You have your uh, frame rate selector knob down here. Uh, you can go down to the lowest mode, which is 10 frames a second, and then it's got some intermediate modes, and it maxes out at 64 frames a second. Uh, there is a little bit of haze and this small window right here, and that lets you know how many feet of film you have left. And to just load it, you just turn the lock on the side here, that panel comes off, and then there's the inside of working of the camera. And so at 64 frames a second, it just kind of goes to show that when camera companies care about the products and the consumers, camera made in the 1950s, still running perfectly. It says a lot about the manufacturer of the brand. Next up is Nikon N90S. This was for prosumer level photographer. Really good built-in light meter, a lot of good functions. I got this from my aunt and uncle who live up in Virginia. They kept it in pristine condition. Uh, I have a Nikon SB22S Speedlight attached with a 28 millimeter f2.8 lens. Overall build quality, really good. It does feel a little plasticky. But when you hold the camera in your hands, you feel the weight of it. Any reservation you may have about the build quality and the use of plastic pretty much fades away pretty quickly. It's a really durable camera. I used it a lot recently. I photographed a wedding for some friends in Swanee with this camera. And it held up really good in what normally isn't a great environment for a camera. You know, out camping in the woods. A lot of moisture, a lot of dirt. Got an HN1 lens hood for it. And uh, this is a really nice camera because it can do a five or six frames a second. But unlike a lot of the older SLR cameras I have, the shutter speed can go up to a one eight thousandth of a second. And so that's really good for freezing motion. In the future, I'm hoping to get a telephoto lens take this thing out to the beach for when my friends and brother are surfing or take it out to the skate park. Oh, I already got the lens for that, nice wide angle lens. Really good light meter built in. Nikon cameras have a really good light meter for color slide film, which is the matrix metering mode. So that's really good for slide film. It also does a spot metering and you know, weighted average metering. Now this is a pretty cool one. Uh, it's an older Hi8 digital camcorder made by Canon. It's an ES75. Don't really know too, too much about this one. I've really kind of enjoyed the results I've gotten from it so far. It's got a really kind of like, you know, vintage look to it, especially when you take it out to a skate park or surfing or wherever like that. And I think nowadays, you know, we're redundant to shoot on a tape and then have it digitized. But if it's a look you're going for, it's definitely worth your money. You can pick them up on eBay for cheap. And I know Best Buy still carries high eight uh, digital videotapes. And those are a little pricey, but I mean, you get like an hour and a half, two hours record time per tape, so definitely worth the money if you want to pick one up.
All right, so next up is an older Canon XLR. There's nothing really special about this model. It's just Canon EOS Elan. It's not so much that this camera is special, it's the lens I got with it. It's an older L-series lens. It's a 35 to 350 millimeter. Sharp as a tack. Built like a tank. It's got the tripod collar mount. Focusing, focusing ring with this thing on manual focus is really smooth. Yeah, this thing is an absolute dream for sports, wildlife, and you can get them used for like anywhere from like six to seven hundred dollars. The weight of it is definitely gonna, you're gonna notice that after about 10 minutes, 15 minutes of walking around at a beach or you know out backpacking or whatever, you're definitely gonna notice the weight right off the bat. This lens was made, the batch of lenses was made in 1994. Fast forward to 2019, I still have it, so autofocus motor and it still works really well, really, really quick. And it also is compatible with modern day Canon EOS cameras. If you definitely have the chance to pick one of these up, I highly recommend it. It's definitely been a good friend of mine as far as a workhorse lens goes. It's all the focal lengths you need for portrait photography, wildlife, sports. So sticking with the Canon brand for another minute here, we have a Canon, what is this, the EOS IX Lite. This, was a, this is an APS SLR. APS film wasn't really too popular back in the day. It was really aimed at consumer level shooters for like vacations, family birthday parties, you know, that kind of thing. And it was all about ease of use. And uh, this right here is an APS film cartridge. And so basically what you do is you just drop this in, close the hatch, and then the camera does the rest. It's pretty cool because if you want, you can stop mid-roll, rewind the film, take it out, switch in a different roll. And uh, so this is kind of cool if you want to go back and forth between black and white. All the information uh, you need is coded onto a magnetic strip onto the film. Definitely a drop down in size from 35 millimeter, uh, one fourth the size of a 35 millimeter negative. There is a noticeable loss in quality if you make larger prints, but for the most part, if you just want like four by five standard drugstore size prints from your vacation or whatever, uh, it can, you know, it holds up pretty well. And so you can use any EOS compatible lens on it. Uh, so if I really wanted to, that is a fully functioning setup that I can use for it. So this one's actually pretty cool. This was a birthday gift from my mom. Uh, it's a Brownie Target 620. Shoots 620 film, which is not produced anymore. Uh, all you have to do though is get in touch with Film Labs, uh, the one I go to uh, is Blue Moon Camera and Machine out in Portland, Oregon, and they actually 3D print the 620 film spool. And the only difference between a 620 film spool and a 120 film spool is probably like a millimeter of difference on the width of the spool at the end. And a lot of people, what they'll do is um, they'll actually take a pair of narrow, uh, nail clippers and they'll just clip off the outer ring of the six, uh, the 120 spool and then they can use that in their 620 camera. It's got two different f-stops, f8 and f16, I believe, and it's the shutter fires at 1 60th of a second. So you definitely, it is a waist-level viewfinder camera, so it does help to hold it steady. Um, but this uh, would have been really popular for families back in the day for weddings and you know, baptisms, that kind of thing. Uh, I believe when it came out, it only cost about two or three dollars, somewhere in that neighborhood. So it really was an affordable way for families to kind of get their hands on a camera and document important milestones in their life. And one of the big things about this box camera is the shutter reset itself. A lot of them, you had to push the shutter down and then make sure to push the shutter back up. But yeah, it's a nice little... That's a little interesting piece of history to own. Next one I'm going to talk about is a Olympus XA2. Uh, there were four versions of this camera. There was the XA1, 2, 3, and 4. And there were uh, some pretty slight differences between all of them. Uh, I believe the first iteration of this camera was a rangefinder. Uh, so, you know, you had manual focusing down here in front of the lens. This one uses zone focusing systems. Cool accessory. Um, a lot of times you don't find the camera and the flash sold together. These things are a lot of fun to use. Highly recommend it if you can get your hands on one. And best for last, the Leica M3. 
my grandfather got this in 1954-1955. The body is built like a tank. It's uh, all brass. Uh, it's got leather right here on the outside for the grip. And this is a rangefinder camera. So basically what that means is you normally with DSLRs you see what the lens sees. So this one you don't see through the lens, you see through this viewfinder right here. And then for focusing, it's got these two viewfinders right here. And what it does is it creates a ghost image, and there's a square focusing patch in the middle. And what you want to do is get those two to uh, line up, and then your image will be in focus, and you take a picture. But it's worth noting that these lenses are probably the most accurate focusing lenses ever made. They're all made by Leica in Germany. They're all made, for the most part, yeah, they're all made by hand, as far as I know. Um, I have a 90mm uh, f2 Summicron, a 50mm f2 Summicron, 28mm f2.8 Elmerit, and then a 135 f2.8, and this is also an Elmerit. Honestly, this is probably one of the best cameras ever made, even today's standards. As far as looks, ergonomics, build quality, craftsmanship, it uh, doesn't get better than these. Um, Leica M3, uh, easily this is my favorite camera to use. I use this one probably more than any of the other ones. There's no built-in light meter, um, but you know having to use an external light meter, I don't mind at all. It's just keeps it keeps it basic. You got your aperture, shutter speed, all the lenses are manual focus. And so that really kind of just, you know, takes you down to your, you know, what skill level you're at as a photographer, keeps you focused on the image you're trying to create.